You are listening to the second segment of the four-part series, Tom Campbell at Sky Blue Symposia. In this segment, Tom discusses his new book, Primal Man, Primal Woman. Tom, as we move along here, we'd like to begin consciously exploring your new book idea, Primal Man, Primal Woman. And Susan will, again, have questions for you here in this topic area. Hi, Tom. I've listened to the interview that you did already on it, and what a wonderful idea. And I'm so delighted that you're going to be exploring this topic that seems so pertinent right now and and so useful. And one of the things that you spoke about is in our relationships between men and women. And maybe you could also speak about what that means, men and women, and the variance on it. When we're stripped back of our fears and belief systems, what remains of us? Yes, that's... um that's kind of the crux of this this book and you know it's not really a book yet it's more of an idea of a book it has an outline and a, and a lot of general ideas that are in my head but it hasn't actually gotten into into uh, the serious writing stage yet because I've just been too busy someday I need to quit answering email and start writing books but uh, until then you know it's it's still just ideas that are coming together so these are kind of rough ideas these aren't ideas that are polished and necessarily worded in in as you know cleverly as they as they should be but they are important ideas as far as this kind of touches the heart of most everybody on the planet you know this sexuality and relationship and gender identification and all of that there's hardly anybody that isn't interested in that subject so it has an immense potential for being helpful to an awful lot of people. And the, the key here is, you know, why does Tom Campbell, a physicist and mystic, I guess a lot of people would call me, why does he think he knows anything about sex? You know, I'm not a sex educator or a, you know, somebody with credentials in that area, but basically it's because when you have a bigger picture as you get and you follow you know, the work I have done, you get to be able to see beyond what's cultural. You know, things that we, the things that we do because the culture tells us this is right. And with a clearer picture, you begin to see things and understand why people act the way they do, you know, why things are the way they do. Even something silly, like why is it that the ladies have a, such a, a hard time with men leaving the toilet seat up? You know, it's <laughs> like, well, can't they just see the toilet seat, see that it's up and put it down? That's not really such a hard thing to do. Why is that such a big problem? But there's a reason why that's a big problem and why that is a, that's a real issue that hits a nerve there. And, of course, the guys just don't get it because to them, they come to toilet seats in all sorts of configurations and they don't have any problem with taking a look and fixing it the way they want it. But with the ladies, it's a little different. And we'll see why that is. It's because we process reality differently. We think differently. We live in different realities. We use, we use different languages and different metaphors. Different things are important and unimportant to us between men and women. And when you understand the very fundamentals of sexuality and evolution, then suddenly a whole lot of these things start to become clear. And of course, as they become clear, you have a better chance of growing out of the ones that are a problem for you and embracing the ones that aren't. Otherwise, you're kind of left dangling in this cultural soup that doesn't really define anything very well. So that was my idea for the book to begin with. And I didn't really plan on saying anything about it until I had something written, but I got asked the question a couple of months back because I had mentioned somewhere that I had such a book I was working on. Your secret's out now. Yeah, the secret's out. So once it got out, there's lots of questions pouring in. So I thought that today, when you asked this question, I would get a little more about the basics, about the fundamentals, and not just the applications. Before, I talked about applications to relationship. How can we take relationships and base them on love? You know, what's the kind of what's a way to do that? 
these are some practical applications. But today I think we'll talk a little bit about the theory because your question you just asked, you know, what what are the main differences here when you when you get rid of the culture, what's left and why is it like that? That's kind of getting to fundamentals and uh I think that's that's probably where I'd like to uh, start. Now I, I warn all the listeners that this is not a whole um detailed derivation because there's just not time for that. I'm just going to pop over the top of things and there'll be a hundred questions that you'll have and things that I could have said, but I didn't because there just wasn't time. And be kind here because uh, I am going to leave a lot of unopened questions, but that's just the way it has to be. But I will try to hit the high spots. Second caveat is that whenever we're talking about people and I say, you know, people are like this and people are like that, you have to realize that that's just shorthand. People are really never like anything. People vary tremendously. So when you say, well, you know, women are like this and men are like that, that means a lot of women, maybe the majority of women are like this, and most men are like that. But you'll always find exceptions. You will find females who have the characteristics that I will subscribe to males, and males that have the characteristics I subscribe to females. And that's as it should be. It's all a continuum. So don't think that you belong in a box and I'm going to give you the criteria for what box you should be in and what you should be thinking. That's not it at all. We're just talking about what I call the fat part of the curve. When I say that, I'm talking about a probability curve. And the fat part of the curve is where most people are. If we think of a bell curve or a, a Gaussian curve, uh, the large majority of the population fits under the fat part of the curve. And that's really the part I'm talking about because all of us will internalize and then express these urges and feelings and things that we have in our own unique way. And our culture has a big input on how that way is, but so does our family and our raising and a hundred other things. So everybody's very different. But we're going to hit just some of the, the major topics, and you'll have to find yourself in here someplace. I'm not talking to everybody, and please don't think I'm, I'm setting a, you know, I'm making boxes to put people in. I really don't want to do that, but because this is going to be kind of short, I fear that some people will kind of jump to that conclusion. Let me get started. Uh, we're going to talk about physical evolution of humans and our sexual evolution. So what were the criteria for physical evolution. Well, for all the critters on the planet, for uh, all the plants as well, there is one set of criteria, and that is survival and procreation. Okay, now I'm talking about our virtual reality, our PMR, physical matter reality here, planet Earth. Survival and procreation. Now, since one must survive in order to procreate, you see that these two criteria are actually entangled, and their combined criteria become forwarding one's genes in the gene pool. Now, that's generally agreed to by scientists to be the evolutionary imperative for all life forms in our physical reality, that all life forms evolve by coming up with strategies. How do they forward their genes in the general gene pool? Now, when I say come up with strategies, I don't mean intellectual strategies and plans, you know. I mean that evolution finds some processes work better than other processes. The ones that work then get procreated and, and uh, survive and they go on and the ones that don't work fall away. So eventually evolution creates a strategy for the survival and procreation, for forwarding one's genes in the gene pool. That's what happens. So that's what I mean by these strategies. Okay, now male and female humans each have their own strategies. Okay, evolved genetically over millions of years, millions of years. Now, the way the world was over those millions of years was pretty uniform for a whole lot of it and has changed dramatically in the last eye blink. You know, in the last probably two or three hundred years, you've seen most of the change. Up to that point, yes, it changed, but it wasn't real dramatic changing. You could at least say that over the last 2,000 years, it hasn't changed. I mean, most of the change has been in the last 2,000 years. But again, that's like a, a thousandth of 1% of the total. So the change happens quickly. What that means is that the um, genetic proclivities we generate, okay, the strategies that we have, our attitudes are hardwired genetically. It's just the way we see things. It's just the way they are. 
And this eye blink in the last thousand years or so just plays them out. Hasn't had much time to change it very much. So we didn't evolve in terms of our current culture. We evolved in terms of millions and millions of years in something that was pretty fundamental. So let's establish the context. Our evolution has taken place over millions of years, and all but the last eye blink in time were harsh. Shelter and food were hard to come by. Survival was problematic. Lifespans were about 35 years. Puberty occurred around 17 to 18 years. Kids were more or less independent and carrying their own weight very early, probably in the 8, 9, 10, maybe earlier than that. They were uh, kind of independent. That doesn't mean they were, they were not having to be taken care of. It just meant that they didn't any longer need to be coddled or everything done for them. There was a lot they could do for themselves. Life was simple and straightforward. There was little social stratification. Okay, our culture now, there's lots of social stratification. Then there was very little. Everybody was more or less in the same boat. Close intra-tribal relationships, that's relationships inside tribes, and cooperation were essential to both survival and successful procreation. Women probably outnumbered men as they do today. Now, that's the situation for which we are genetically programmed. And here we find ourselves, the 2000s and the 21st century, having to deal with a very, very different culture. And these are the programs that we're running. So this is what we're going to look at and see if we can't see some of the reasons why we feel and do the things we do. Symmetry in size and in sexual function leads to an asymmetry in strategy, forwarding one's genes in the gene pool. Okay, now what do I mean by forwarding one's genes in the gene pool? That means you get to successfully, you survive and get to procreate and your genes, your genetic material then goes on into the gene pool to survive and procreate and that goes on to survive and so on. So you begin creating a family tree, if you will, that's going to have long branches and, and uh, long roots. So you want your genes to keep going in this gene pool. You want to contribute as much of your own genetic material as you can to the whole of humanity. That's what we mean by forwarding one's genes in the gene pool. Okay, because male and females uh, have different asymmetries, then these asymmetries lead to different strategies. Two sexually related asymmetries are that women are physically smaller and weaker than men, and that men impregnate the women and the women have the babies. Those are things that we're just different that way. Pregnant women and women nursing and caring for children are less able to take care of themselves and their children than if they were not pregnant or if they didn't have children to take care of. They need some help to get by in this harsh environment. Now, let's talk about forwarding one's genes in the gene pool. First, male. Male evolutionary strategy in the form of evolving genetic programs. Okay, now let's talk about the hardwired programs that men have and why they have them. Now, these hardwired programs are just strategies that evolve, that help men forward their own genes in the gene pool, okay? Because that's what everybody does. That's what evolution supports. It supports those who forward their genes in the gene pool. If yours get forwarded, then yours contribute more to how evolution changes than if you don't. So men have two strategies. Women have three. But here are the men's two strategies. One strategy is just a numbers game. For a man to get his genetic material as much as possible into the gene pool, a numbers game. Have sex with as many physically attractive women as are available to him. Okay, That will promote his genes. That's one strategy. Now, what do I mean by attractive? Uh, attractive means, and men have one criteria basically for attractive, and that's good physical and genetic health. Because if you don't find a female with good physical and genetic health, then your genes are likely not to make it very far. Okay, the infant may not survive, may have a, a harder time getting into the gene pool and then having more children of their own. Now, how do we, how do we associate this good physical and genetic health? That's what our criteria for attractive is based on. Attractive has to do, say, with symmetry. People find a, an attractive, a pretty face, is one that's symmetric. The more perfectly symmetric, 
the prettier we think it is. And this is across cultures. Across all cultures, this is generally the case. Why? Because if you have very good symmetry, that means the genetics are what paying attention in good order. There's not much uh, wrong there or not much randomness has come in. So healthy uh, genes can be seen in, in good symmetry. Also, one looks at physical things like skin tone and that sort of thing for signs of physical health, you know, general ability to move and, and you know, attitude, you know, smiles versus frowns, etc. Those are the things that make people attractive to one another. And that attractive is based on helping you get your genes into the gene pool. All right. So let me say that again. Numbers game. Have sex with as many physically attractive and in this case, there's kind of a low standard for attractive women as are available to him. Okay, now the second strategy that will help him get his genes into the gene pool is secure the highest quality available woman to invest in. Pair bond with as many physically attractive, this to a higher standard, females as possible. One, that turns out in general, just for practical reasons, that as many as possible turns out to be one because there's a lot of challenges, particularly in this time we're talking about now. Remember, it's a very harsh environment and taking care of females and children is not an easy thing to do, seeing that they you know, survive in order to procreate and carry your genetic material forward. is pretty much a full-time job and then some during this time. So even though it says pair bond with as many physically attractive females as possible, that in the practical sense, turns out generally to be one, which makes the pair bond actually a single pair bond. But that's something of practical. The number one is practical, not necessarily hardwired. Let's kind of pull all this together and skip the parents. A secure high quality available woman to invest in a pair bond with as many physically attractive females as possible, okay, to ensure their survival and the survival and success of their offspring. Now, this pair bond implies that he, because of his investment, expects her to limit her sexual activity to him, and he will take care of her and her children in return. You see, he doesn't want to expend his resources trying to further somebody else's genetic material into the gene pool. So that's kind of an arrangement. He, he will take care of her and her children and make sure they are protected and survive enough to pass the genes forward, okay, something he can't do himself. He can only pass them forward to one generation. They have to be healthy and survive to pass them on forward past that. This is where our pair bond comes from. And notice this, there's going to be a bit of asymmetry here as well. So the pair bond is not necessarily just one pair. It could be more than one pair. But practical considerations have made evolution partial to one, one pair, which makes it a real pair bond instead of multiple pair bonds, because that has been practical. If the downside is, let's say there was a male to have many pair bonds, many women with which he helped the female and her children survive, then because when we, we later we talk about the women, you would see that he would probably end up spending a lot of his time furthering the genetic material of other men besides himself. That's just the way that works. Now, we'll get to that a little later. So, all right, let's, those are the two strategies that a male could use to further his own genes in the gene pool. Now, a lot of the, some of the logical consequences. Let's look at the male's problem. He wants to find women who will have sex with him and then later find an attractive woman with a good reproductive potential who will accept him as her mate. He is hardwired to initially see women as sex objects, but also, at the same time, more as he matures, is looking for quality worth committing to and investing in. Also, after the children are self-sufficient and no more are on the way, the original point of the sexual programming ends, while the programming continues forever. Once we, you know, we come in with these genetic programs and they run as long as we're alive. It's not that these programs go away. They run as long as we're alive to the extent that our, our physiology will support them. Men are attracted to and pushed by their genetic programming to have sex with any attractive female who might make herself available to him. 
and men feel responsible to protect and take care of their wives and children. They expect their pair-bonded mate to limit her sexual activity to him to protect his investment. They are somewhat competitive with each other to attract who they consider the best choice for mate, but since they choose firstly on the criteria of satisfactory physical attractiveness, they usually have many potential choices. Men have a need for their woman to demonstrate to them that they are valued as sexual partner and as a provider protector. That is, they need women, they need their woman to validate their success at accomplishing their genetically driven mission. Note that though it is easier and less complicated to have a single woman satisfy both strategies, right? The one that was the numbers and the other one was the investment. It's easier and less complicated to have a single woman satisfy both strategies. There is no evolutionary hardwired requirement to do so. Thus, having a wife does not conflict fundamentally or primally with having a lover. His genetic material will go forward just as well whether he has the same person solving both of those uh, hardwired strategies or whether they're different people. That doesn't affect his evolutionary hardwiring. Now let's look at forwarding one's genes in the gene pool for females. What would her evolutionary strategy be? She has her own programs. She has three of them. One of them is bear the most survivable children possible. Secure the highest available quality sperm. That means be sexually attractive as possible to men in general and induce the one that is most attractive, okay, the most attractive to have sex with her, thus optimizing survival success of her offspring. If her offspring survive, then her genetic material goes forward. All right, now what does it mean for her when I say attractive? Okay, to induce the one that is most attractive. Well, that's the one that has the best quality sperm equals most attractive. Uh, there's two criteria here. One is the same as the male, good physical and genetic health. And it goes pretty much by the same scorecard. Uh, you know, uh, symmetry uh, gives uh, indication of good genes and skin and muscle tone and uh, athleticness and you know, movement and a lot of other things tell about general health, attitudes, and so on. Okay, but besides that, they have another criteria. Plus, they're looking for someone who would produce offspring with the highest survival success quality. They not only want, want uh, children to be healthy, but they want someone who can provide that protection and those resources and that support that will make sure that those children, those offspring, survive and go on. So that's the second, and actually that turns out to be the more important one. That's the more important one to her getting the, uh, her genetic material into the gene pool. Okay, so that's number one. Now number two is form a pair bond with and remain attractive to a highly survivable, successful, and reliable man so that he will take care of and protect both her and her children for the long term. Because if her children, if she bears children, but those children uh, don't make it, if they starve or uh, somehow uh, are killed or get diseases or whatever, then her genetic material does not go forward. Her genetic material only goes forward with the baby she bears. Now, pair bond implies to her that he commits to her and to her children and that he thinks she is special. I put that in quotes. That means that he's committed to her and will put her above and ahead of other women and other women's children. Okay, because if not, if he puts other women or other women's children ahead of her, then her children's survival and procreation later are jeopardized. Now, thirdly, she has a, a numbers game as well, and that is have as many healthy and well-cared-for children as practical conditions allow. Okay, now notice there's some interesting things there. To him, this pair bond meant that she has sexual relations just with him because that protects his investment. If he's going to put effort into her survival and the survival of her children, then he wants her children to be his children. Okay, He doesn't want them to be some other man's children. To her, pair bond implies 
that he commits to her and her children and that he'll put her above and ahead of other women and other women's children. So this pair bond really means different things, implies different things to each one of them. Okay, now what are some of the logical consequences here? Okay, well, the female's problem. She must find an attractive man, one with good reproductive potential, and a man with good provider and protector potential. Two things. She is hardwired to be attractive, at least superficially look like sex object anyway, and to use that female power to secure both superior quality sperm and protection and support for herself and her children. Also, after the children are gone and no more are on the way, the original point of the sexual programming ends while the programming continues forever. Okay, just like with the male, this programming, this hard wiring goes on as long as you're still kicking. Okay, now that's partly uh, responsible for what we call midlife crisis and emptiness syndrome. We end up with programming, but no point of the programming anymore. That puts us into a bit of a tailspin. Again, these things are not intellectual. When I say women feel this way or act this way, it's not that they're doing this with their intellect. This is the this is the below the intellect genetic programming we're talking about. Also note that though it is easier and less complicated, that is more convenient to have a single man satisfy strategies one and two, there's no evolutionary hardwired requirement to do so. Thus, having a husband does not conflict fundamentally or primally with having a lover. Women are driven, pushed by their hardwired genetic programming, to be sexually attractive as possible, want men in general to want to have sex with them. That's very different than want men in general to have sex with them. That's not what they want. They want men in general to want to have sex with them, while reserving the right to be able to choose who and when. Women are very competitive in their sexual attractiveness to get and keep a man. However, physically attractive, physical attractiveness is only half, the lesser half, of the attractiveness criteria that they apply to men. More importantly, they also rate men on their internal and external personal power. I put that in quotes, personal power. Okay, what does that mean? More survivable offspring and better provider. So the guys have to have, besides the good looks, which gives them health and good genetic material, they have to have initiative, taking charge, strength, brightness, intelligence, confidence, social status, pecking order among peers, uh, ability to provide and protect, physically fit, athletic, independent, aggressive, have gumption, resourcefulness, competency, a plan for the future, ambition, knowledge, potential to accure necessary resources, as well as things like depth of character, empathy, and sensitivity. Women have a need for their men to demonstrate to them that he is committed to her and see her as special and valued, particularly above other women, thus validating her success at accomplishing her genetically driven mission. Today, a minority of women, particularly if they're immature, often have trouble translating their hardwired sense of attractiveness from cave dweller days to apartment dweller days. Attributes such as aggressive, now this is their, their attractiveness for men, okay? They, they have certain ways that they have over the millions of years of very hard times come with what that means to them. How do you, it's easy about the good genetics, that's symmetry, or about the good health. You can get a good sense of that just from looking at a person, but how do you come up with this good provider, good protector, um, good person to make sure the children survive and go on to have their own children. How do, you, how do you get to that? Well, it differs from, you know, the caveman days to the, to the days of today. Okay, attributes such as aggressive, domineering, independent, secure, physically big and strong, wealthy, social status, political power. And that political power, I don't mean political in a, in a narrow sense, but political power in the home, political power in the office, political power in the community, uh, potential or actual financial power, or simple popularity like singers and movie stars. 
may singly or in combination ring genetic pre-programmed bells that turn out to be dysfunctional in today's culture and have no relationship to quality of consciousness at all. Occasionally, by confusing attractive personal power with arrogance, confidence, bluster, and indifference, many young women filter out the nice guys and are attracted only to the self-centered, self-promoting manipulators who know how to manipulate female hardwired genetic sexual programming, generally losers and duds with high opinions of themselves. Now, for both guys and girls, higher quality, nice girls, and nice guys are not into manipulating others to this extent because they want valuable relationships, not simply the ability to use another person to satisfy their needs. So we have a million years of evolution, and we apply that to differing attitudes, approaches, and ways of interpreting and dealing with the world. So we're going to get a million different expressions of these attitudes. We will mention just a few, and each may apply to just a small subset of women, but I just want to mention a few of these because these will be the applications that kind of that you can look at things. I mentioned a toilet seat, and I didn't plan to talk about that, but you can ask about it if you want. But for instance, men master the outside world. They need that to provide for and protect the tribe, their mate, and their children, and then lastly, their self. They focus on teamwork and cooperation. Interaction primarily with outside environment requires focus and attention to outside details. They apply intellect to the outside environment. They stumble and feel one's way through the inside environment. Now, what's the inside environment? Well, we'll go to the ladies. Women master the inside world, relationship building, networking. If something happens to them, they would like to have some other women committed to them enough to care for their children and move their genetic material forward. And this would have to be over those other women's ability to care for their own children okay, and move their own genetic material forward. So that requires a pretty serious relationship. They juggle competition and personal connections through clicks, interaction primarily with inside environment, parallel process spreads focus over many tasks. Okay, in their life for these millions of years, they had many things to do at the same time. And of course, science will tell us that women are very good at parallel processing, much better than men. I mean, all of us have, have watched a secretary sit at her desk, talk on the phone, file her nails, type, and have a conversation all time process, all at the same time. Ladies can keep more things going at once than, uh, than men can. Also, science will tell you that men have better spatial relationships. They can see in pictures more easily because that's part of that outside focus and attention to outside detail. Now, ladies apply intellect to their inside environment and get by with charm and assistance in the outside environment. Inside environment, the environment of relationship is where they are masters, and they do that intentionally with their intellect. The men are, are sort of the masters and use their intention and intellect in the, in, in the outside environment, dealing with the outside world. Okay, that's just the way evolution has programmed us. Okay, let's, let's look at some cultural consequences. Again, these cultural consequences are different for the individual. There's some that uh, jump to mind immediately in our culture. We expected both male and female to be true in their marriage. Fidelity is a cultural requirement. We have expectations and roles of males and females. You know, the men are the doctors and the women are the nurses, right? We have, you know, men don't cry and ladies don't belch in public. You know, we have all these uh, expectations of male and female. Fashion, obviously, is differentiated sexually. There's value given to men and women by our culture. And there's differing cultural values, like taking charge versus nurturing you see, that are, that are sex-related. Let's look at two facts here. We have a male-dominant culture, period. The great majority of males and females are very much fear and belief-driven. The males and females both are not real grown up here. They still have a lot of fear and a lot of belief, a lot of ego, and a lot of expectations that they have to deal with. Much culturally-derived fear is around both relationship 
and sexuality. And much of that is created by the dissonance between genetic programming and cultural programming, cultural values. But because ours is a male-dominant culture, this fear takes a much larger toll on females than males. Women are often confused. Now, again, when I say women, I mean some women, you know, some of the time. I'm not talking about every woman, but we're talking about generalities here. Women are confused. The culture tells them to be hot, hot, hot in some roles and not, not, not in other roles. Because of our cultures, our basically immature, egoic male image of women, which is what our culture predominates because both our men and women are immature, egoic uh, individuals, but this is a male-dominated culture, so we get this immature, egoic male image of women in our culture. They are sex objects who take care of children and do domestic work. That's the cultural idea of women. Women are culturally undervalued by this lopsided view. Women, of course, know deep down that they have personal value, personal quality, beyond this limited vision of sex objects who take care of children and do domestic work. The result is that in our culture, women form an underclass whose personal worth is not fully validated by a male-made cultural feminine stereotype. Cultural beliefs are absolute and accepted at the being level. We don't question our cultural beliefs. But this creates identity issues and self-worth issues, and for many, leaves a systemic low-level tension between the sexes, because any underclass resents being an underclass, even if they fully accept the situation as natural or as just the way it is. This tension, on one hand, creates a subtle subconscious chip on the shoulder attitude, a nonspecific uneasiness and less than total trust and appreciation of men and their cultural dominance, a fear of being used or taking advantage of, a wariness, all usually beneath the intellect. On the other hand, it also creates identity confusion, self-worth issues, feeling of inadequacy and insecurity. Insecurity creates fear of being too hot and too cold a fear of being not exactly whatever it is a female should be, a model that is only shallowly provided by the culture. The value and definition of being female is defined in our culture primarily in terms of a female's expected services to others, rather than in terms of her individual quality of being. Let me say that one again. That's kind of a, an important summary. The value and definition of being female is defined in our culture primarily in terms of a female's expected services to others rather than in terms of her individual quality of being. Okay, so fear creates anxiety and ego reactions from don't tread on me to I'm only good for being tread on and confusion all rolled up into an undefined stress and anxiety. Women feeling insecure and inadequate for reasons that they cannot quite put their finger on. Many eventually make an accommodation with their culture and with their men, but the solution never quite feels right or complete, something they learn to live with. Now, a sizable minority of this minority begin to feel bad about themselves. One may counter feeling insecure and inadequate by trying to be perfect which demonstrates that you're not inadequate or insecure. But trying to be perfect may lead to an ego needing to be perfect. And being a perfectionist always leads to a failure, since no one can be perfect. Failure just reinforces one's feeling bad about oneself and feeling inadequate. So they end up in a vicious downward spiral, ending in great distress, personal dislike often, and depression and a prescription for Prozac. Why do so many more women than men take depression medication? Now, that's, a, that's kind of a real quick zip along the top of a whole lot of issues and then a few of how these issues interact with our culture to create problems. You see, we have these hardwiring programs running in us that urge us to be and act and do and feel in a certain way, and then we have a culture that 
doesn't appreciate us or, you know, doing and being and acting in that certain way. And we have to somehow combine and, and, uh, get these, the two together. Otherwise we end up with stress. We end up with problems, with confusion. And these problems don't usually bubble up into our intellect as problems. They just fester down in, in the unconscious at the being level. We don't really understand what the problem is, but we know it isn't just quite right. It's close maybe, but it's just not quite all it should be. So that's kind of a, a thumbnail sketch of the fundamental reasons why male and females are different is because one impregnates the other and the other has the baby. They have different strategies for surviving and getting their genetic material forward. That's, that's what evolution rewards is you getting your genetic material forward. That's what changes things in evolution. So that kind of gives us a, a real quick look at that. You know, I guess I'll, I'll leave that for questions and then we can talk later about the uh, relationships that you started with. You know, how do we how do we move into love relationships rather than yeah. need-based relationships? And how does all this fade? But I think I better stop here before I start another speech, get down off my soapbox, and, uh, and let you folks ask me some questions. We are pausing the discussion to enable our guests to provide more information about their work and activities. Sky Blue Symposia is speaking with Tom Campbell. Tom, would you tell us a little bit about the books that you have, what's going on, any symposiums that you're offering to those people that follow you? Sure. Those people who are listening to this who want to know more, have an interest, uh, there are several places you can go. Uh, one, of course, would be my website, which is www.mybigtoe.com. There you will be able to buy books, but if you really don't want to buy a book, you can go to Google Books and you can read it there for free. Uh, otherwise, you could go to Amazon or, or Barnes & Noble or any bookstore, and, and if they don't have it, you can always order it. So it's available pretty much out there in all the usual, usual ways. You go to my website, and there's a forum there. And on that forum, there's lots of discussion and lots of very smart people who have been talking about this and thinking about it uh, for a long time, very knowledgeable. And that would be a good place to either just read. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of posts there on every subject imaginable. And that would be a good place to find out more of your specific questions. Otherwise, for general information, go to YouTube. And YouTube, you could type in my YouTube ID, which would be TWCJR44, or you can just type in Tom Campbell, or you could probably just type in my big toe and you will be able to get it pretty quickly. Or you can go to Google and Google Tom Campbell or my big toe and they will show you lots of places that you can go. But the YouTube station is, is nice, or I guess channels, what they call it, is very nice because I have all of the workshops and all of the interviews that I've done go up on YouTube. And they're there available um, for everyone for free. One of the best ones, if you want a good summary of the ideas here and, and get a good understanding of the theory as well as the practice of how to apply it, would be the Calgary workshop. And it came in a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Basically just a few hours on Friday intro. And then Saturday is the theory and Sunday is the application. So if you go there, you will get perhaps more than you really want, but still it's a, it's a good overall uh, view of what I'm all about and what my theories are. You'll get more of the science there because I deal with the science more in my lectures than I do in my books because the books are really targeted to a, a very general audience and the workshops are people who are already interested or they wouldn't be there. If you want more of the science, find it at, at YouTube. You can find it on YouTube, and you can find it at MBT Events. That's the third place to go. MBTEvents.com are the people that do my organization, my scheduling. They put the things up on YouTube for me, and they schedule uh, where I go and, and uh, when I go there. So that is a good site to find out what's, what's happening in the near future. Well, that's about it. So um, I, I urge everyone to look into more more detail because in an interview like this it's very difficult to give you enough detail to answer even your most fundamental questions it's kind of a quick pass over the top of a lot of very interesting ideas but there's really not a lot of time for deriving the the answers that i give I, you pretty much i just state them and and that's that you kind of have to take it at uh, you know 
words value. And that's sometimes not, not good enough for a lot of people. They'd like to see, well, why did he say that? Where did that come from? Well, you'll find it on YouTube and in the books. Thanks, Tom. After a short musical interlude, we will return to the symposium. thing I just want to say is is so compact and yet it's going to take so long to unpack unpack it there's just so much in there it's just very condensed yes that's the way Uh, I am dense yeah (laughs) Yeah. my books are the same way very dense with information but uh, yeah it'll take a somebody will have to listen to this 10 times before all of it kind of sinks in it's a whole lot to to think about at one time but it explains so much. It's just quite amazing, you know, the current conflicts going on culturally and against our hard wiring and so much confusion. And I know everybody's having a hard time with it. I want to know, especially, you know, you mentioned it briefly about the differences in the commonalities between men and women. Do you think you could touch on that just a wee bit more? Tell me a little more what you mean. I'm more specific, so I don't go on to another ramble here. And I well, touch. it sounds to me like there, there's the two agendas for men and the three agendas mm-hmm. for women, but the commonalities are more about survival of the species, obviously, and transmitting our genetic material. They they seem it, to harmonize a bit if it, if it works. Yeah, it, it you know there is great harmony here, and there's a lot of things that just connect together. I mean, they both have to produce children if their genetic you know material is going to go forward all right mm-hmm. well they actually have to do that together you know neither yeah. ones often do that by themselves it's also very good for each of them to take care of those kids and each other you know so mm-hmm. that the male and her children survive because if they don't survive then the genetic material doesn't go anywhere so yeah. they have to work together to do mm-hmm. that a lot of things that that work Pretty well. There's a few but things. There's also a, a huge potential for mistrust and fear based on those, in some but, ways, divergent programming. Exactly, because it furthers the guy's genetic interest if she limits her sexuality to him because he's putting in an investment and he doesn't want to invest in somebody else's genes. On the other hand, from her viewpoint, if she's got a guy who's helping her offspring go forward, it doesn't make a difference to her whether that's the guy you know is the father of the children or not because mm. all her children no matter who fathered them have her genetic material in it and if right. he helped further them then good for her so mm-hmm. she doesn't have really a whole lot of investment in his investment so though she has to make him want to stay and be with her and protect her so he she kind of has to go along with that on the other hand it's not really in her genetic interest to care a whole lot about that I know one of the most surprising statistics that I have read, wish I could remember the author in the name of this book, was a lady who did a lot of genetic studies while on women. And one of, one of these studies, she looked at families and she gave some kind of excuse that they were just doing some kind of uh, family genetic screening, a lot da 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 da. And if you and your whole family would come in, we would do free genetic tests and so on because we're just collecting data. And she had lots of families come in where the husband, wife, and all their children would come in, and they all got free genetic counseling at the end of it if there were any problems and so on. But what was really going on in the background is she was collecting data for her book. What found out was, big surprise to me anyway, is that 30% of the children in these relationships were not fathered by you know, her husband. Yeah, I've heard that before. It's quite shocking, really. You know, I would have thought maybe... You know, 3%, 5%, something like that. Now, these weren't mixed marriages in the sense that she comes with her children, he came with her, you know, his children. A couple get married, have kids, you know, family, nuclear family, and so on. And about 30% 
you know, I, I'm always being skeptical. The skeptical side realizes that I'm not sure how good a science this was. In other words, there were probably a few hundred families, not 10,000. So the yeah. number's small. And secondly, I don't think these families were picked by statistically representing the country. You know, it's not mm -hmm. like you know, when they do polling and they ask a few people from this economic structure and a few of this race and a few of that, and they get a good statistical sample that rings true across the whole country. I don't think that was the case. I think she used whatever family she could get, you know, to come in and do her programming. So they just were, you know, take whatever was around. So that, that mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily ring true against the whole of us. But still, 30% is a pretty large number. Well, you can kind of see this when you look at what the hard wiring is. You see lots of reasons for males and females to come together and stay together and have really good relationships with each other. And you see some reasons why there's sometimes problems, you know, festering around the sides of that because they're not always on the same sheet of music. They're not always have each other's best interest, you know, at heart. They have their own programming. And this program, mm -hmm. like I say, has gone on over millions of years, and it's just the way they see the world. It's yeah. not an intellectual thing that they think, oh, I can go have an affair, I can get away with it. But it's that this is the way they, they think. When you run into, when a female runs into a man's male she finds attractive, it's just her program that starts evaluating him as mm -hmm. someone that's, that uh, you know, will produce offspring. And it doesn't matter whether she's 20 or whether she's 70. It's just the way the program runs. The program doesn't have a, a uh, well, you're over 35 now, so let's shift to program B because people didn't live past 30s. So the program only runs for young people, but it never stops running. We get that same program forever. Okay, other, uh, other questions about what we're, where we've been? How do we get past this need and move into love in our relationships? Do you think it starts with acknowledging that this is what's really going on and, well, I, you know? I, yes, I do. And, you know, I think the thing is that if we don't understand that this is what's going on, then we're at a disadvantage. Because if we don't have all the information and realize we have this genetic programming, then we tend to make mistakes, we tend to overreact, we tend to uh, come to judgments that mm -hmm. aren't really so much that, you know, oh, what an awful person, but somebody's just doing what they're made to do, you know, this is, this genes work. So we need to have a bigger understanding, but we also don't have to be a slave to our genetic programming. This is just what's evolved over the last, you know, millions of years, and it will change. Our genetic programming is a live thing, it's not fixed forever. But like I said, we're just an eye blink away of that, you know, of that million years worth of uh, that programming. And it doesn't change that quickly, but it will change. And the way it changes is if we change and if different behaviors become more uh, survivable and work better for us. And obviously, there are some different behaviors here that would be more valuable to us than behaviors that we had when we were running around living in caves and climbing trees to get away from tigers, you know, that was a different world. Different behaviors work there that don't work as well now. So our changes will help modify that, that code, but it'll take some time. But yet we're in charge, you know, we're in charge of what we do. Our choices are ours and we can't use this genetic program and say, oh, it's just the way I'm programmed. I can't help it. You know, it's just the way I'm. you know that there is this, this uh, proclivity, this urging that's there by the genetics, but you get to make the decision. And you make that decision based on the quality of your consciousness. And you're responsible for those decisions, and you pay the price for bad ones, and you reap the rewards for good ones. So that's, that's the focus that we have to have. So that gets us then into how do we get past need and move into love in our relationships? You know, well, we grow up, you know, we get serious about eliminating fear, ego, beliefs, and expectations. We tend to, and part of this is our culture as well, it's our culture and our programming kind of bumping into each other. Sometimes mm. we just don't get along. We've got this, we get anxiety when our culture and our programming, you know, aren't pointed in the same direction. We start to get anxiety about things. So our culture and our programming are at odds and part of this is what generates 
fear that we have about relationships because we have feelings that gone this way, but yet we know we should behave in a different way, and we get confused about that. It happens to us because, in general, men and women are you know, kind of a low-quality consciousness beings. That's what we're here for. We're here to grow up. This is an elementary school. You know, you should not feel bad about that. It's just we're all like that. So we're in this together. We're trying to grow up. But we tend to fall in need with each other rather than fall in love with each other. And that's part of this programming. I suspect back in the Paleolithic age when, when uh, you know, we were living in caves, the need was primary. Because if you didn't survive, you know, the species didn't go on. You know, that was a real big deal. So the needs, the things you needed, the things you needed to survive and get by were paramount. Anything else was a luxury. Well, it's not like that anymore. You know, most of us can have our basic needs met. You know, food, shelter, safety, you know, that's not the big deal anymore. We can do that. So the need needs to start to give way to something a little more valuable to us than the need. We need to grow up. You know, we're not cavemen anymore and we need to, to grow up. So from our history, though, we fall in need with each other. We find somebody who will satisfy our needs. And we have lots of needs, emotional needs, spiritual needs, you know, physical needs. And we find somebody that satisfy those needs and we call it love. But that's not love. Need is different than love. Love is about other Need is about self. So when you fall in need, it's about you getting your yes. – when you fall in love, it's about other, what you can do for that person. How can you meet their needs? How can you give to them? That's what it's about. Getting your own needs met is just not important. That's not all that significant. It's about meeting others' needs. So that's the difference between love and a love-based relationship and a need-based relationship. Then comes the question, well, if most of us have relationships because we fell in need with each other, that's problematical because needs change. As needs change, we have to keep kind of renegotiating this needs-based relationship, you see, because that's what it is. I'll, so, you know, I'll, I'll satisfy your needs if you satisfy my needs. It's a bargain. It's a deal. You know, it's, a, it's a business arrangement pretty much. And business arrangements grow old because conditions change and they have to continually be renegotiated. That's not like love. Love, when you love, love is really is forever. It's just the way it is. You feel that way. Like is not forever. Trust is not forever. Love is forever. Love is very fundamental. What do we And it's do? unconditional, as you said. It's unconditional. Oh, yeah, if it's not unconditional, it's not love. See, conditional says, I'll love you if, and then comes the condition. Well, that's not, <laughs> because the if is, the if is something you want. You know, one of your conditions, one of your needs is what the condition is. Well, that's not love. That's a negotiated contract. I'll do, you know, if you do this, I'll do that. And I'll do that if you do this. You know, that's our relationships for the most part. So how do we move those? to a love-based relationship. Well, if you've got a needs-based relationship, it kind of, it's that way because it's that way. Somehow you have to break out of that paradigm, break out of that kind of vicious uh, cycle. And the best way to do that, given, you know, uh, understanding how these programs work, the best way to do that is for the man to take charge, for the man to realize and have a discussion with his woman and say, you know, we, we really need to move this to a different level. Just, you know, satisfying each other's needs is, is not a good long-term strategy. It's, it's a way to get by, but it's not a way to shine. It's a way to get through the world, you know, with company, but it's not really a way to experience the, the joy and the completeness and the beauty of a love-based relationship. So, you know, it's not that uh, a negotiated contract can't work. It's that it's, it's a shadow of what it could be is the thing. Even some of them get to be very good. But most of the ones that get to be very good, it's because the, the love part of it is growing. You see, relationships aren't like 100% need and 100, or 100% love. It's not a one or a zero. Most of us have mixtures. We've got some of it need-based and some of it is love-based. We do care about the other person. And it is about them, some, 
and it is about us some. So we have this mixed bag, and as it becomes more about them, it gets to be a more joyful relationship. As it becomes more about us, it gets to be a more problematic relationship. So the way to break out of this vicious cycle is, one, you have to decide together that breaking out of it would be a good thing and that it's something that you could do and would like to do. So that's the first thing. It's not something that you want to spring on somebody without telling them what you're doing. Then the guy should lead, and he should take charge to love his woman, and that means get rid of the the need. In other words, if there is a problem, he should see the problem as his problem to solve. And it doesn't matter where the problem comes from. It's not analyze the problem and see if it's a good problem that should be solved and then solve it. But if she has a problem, if she has an issue, if she has a need, if she has something she, she would like that would make her happy, then, guy, do it. If there's some disagreement comes up, guy, she's right. Okay, Don't argue with her. Make her happy. That's not the point. Now, that doesn't mean you can't point out things to her that would be helpful to her, but you point them out because... You care about her, not because, huh, you know, I know and you don't, or you're wrong and I'm right. So that's kind of the, the approach. Now, the way this works, so if the guy will do that, if he will just love her, if he will support her, if, she, if he will make it his job to make her happy, and she's not happy if he's telling her that she's got it wrong or that what she wants doesn't make sense or isn't reasonable, that doesn't make her happy, doesn't make her feel special, okay, above all others. So just make her happy, whatever it takes, but you have to be in charge of it. That doesn't mean, when I said this before, you know, I, I hadn't gone through all of the basic uh, evolutionary stuff, and when I said you have to make her happy, whatever she wants, whatever it takes, do it, a lot of guys kind of got the idea that they needed to become puppy dogs. You know, they needed to become uh, love slaves. And she'd say, you know, stand on one foot in the corner and they'd go running through it. That's not what I mean. It's not that you become a puppy dog guy. It's that you have to take the lead. You have to be creative. You have to think of things to make her happy. And you know a few things, like arguing with her doesn't make her happy, or telling her she doesn't know what she's talking about, or telling her that, I don't want to paint the damn wall. It just was painted a couple of years ago. It doesn't need it. That's you. That's about you. And you not wanting to do something, extra work, let that go. Make it about her. Of course, honey, we'll paint that wall. We'll make it a nice lavender. Go, you know, get a whole new uh, bed set, and whatever. Whatever makes you happy. Of course, we'll do that. So this is what I'm saying. But the guy doesn't wait for her to say, well, what I want you to do next is to paint my wall. He needs to see what she wants, what would make her happy, and then move to do it before he gets asked. It's one of these things, if I have to ask, it doesn't count. So he has to take charge and love her, period, without any ifs, without any conditions. Now, what that will do will give her enough security will give her enough room enable her to also grow up and love him in the same way when she realizes that he will do anything to make her happy and she can count on that and it can't be an act he can't just act this way because i want to wait and see what happens he actually has to feel this way because if it's an act she will know it that will be obvious it has to be genuine so, guys, you have to really do this, not just go through the motions and do it. But when she feels that it's genuine, and that might take six months, it's like, is this real? Is he just doing this? You know, is this all coming out of his intellect, or does he just really feel this way? When she gets to the point she thinks you really feel that way, then she will have the freedom and the security to give back in a similar way. She can now let go of her fears and her conditions because they're not necessary anymore. Why would she need conditions? Why would she need a condition? I'll do this if you do that because he's doing all of that and more. So the conditions just fall away and she ends up treating him in the same way. She just lives to make him happy. Whatever he needs, whatever makes him happy, that's what she wants to do. And whatever makes her happy, that's what he wants to do. And can you see how this is just the most glorious relationship ever when two people 
are just trying to make the other one happy. It works very, very well. But you have to start it someplace. And it starts best with the men because they are more naturally fit to take that position of leadership and give the women a safe place in which to change themselves. But now they can't be in charge of changing the lady. They just have to be in charge of changing themselves. They can't say, now I'm going to, I've given you a whole lot of stuff. Now you need to do some things for me. That's the old, I'll do this if you do that. That's not what it's about. She has to grow up in her own way, in her own time, but she will because she also has this program that wants this relationship to be very tight and very solid because that solves her programming mission. So this is a way for her to get her programming mission. It's a way for him to get his programming mission, and it works perfectly together. So that's kind of the advice to men and women is think about moving your relationship from a need-based to a love-based and come up with a good strategy on how you're going to approach that and then let the guy take it from there. And if he's up to it, if he can do it, it'll work. If he can't, then it won't work. Or if she can't grow up to it, if he does, then it won't work. It takes two to make a relationship. It only takes one to love. So even if he can but she can't, he can still have a wonderful relationship because it's not about him. It doesn't matter what she does or doesn't do. You see, there are no conditions. He can just love her and enjoy making her happy, and her happiness makes him happy. That's all he needs. You can love individually, but a relationship, a really solid relationship, takes two. Two people have to want to have that relationship. But one who's loving and one who's needing can still have a better relationship than two who are needing. So don't be afraid to go there with, oh, what if I do this and it doesn't work out? That's because you have conditions. It has to work out or you don't want to bother. So that's kind of the advice. Now, when I talked to this in, in a couple of other forums, spent a whole lot more time on it than we really have here. So you can maybe listen to those and get a little more detail. But I've, I've basically uh, told you the, the nuggets and the, and the crux of it. So do you have any other questions or things that you think I missed on this one? I'm just reflecting on what you've been speaking of, Tom, and it it sounds like perfect opportunity to, by entering into this, to lower our entropy, to really be unconditional love. I can see how it would help both people in the relationship in fabulous ways. There's one thing I w- wish you would address, and you've used the term men and women, and we have all types of relationships right now, so maybe you could kind of address that to the yes. variations in that. Yeah, I'm using men or women because that's just is the fat part under the curve, right? That's the way it is for right. the majority of people, so that's what I'm using. But this is not to leave out those same-sex people. They love as well. It fits exactly to them. They mostly have need-based relationships as well, That really combinations. We all have combinations of need and and love in our relationships, but some of them are more need and, and some of them are more love. What we want to do is, meet, is move those to all love. But even in homosexual relationships of either sex, typically because of our culture and the way we interact with each other, one of those people will kind of take the traditional male role and the other will kind of take the traditional female role. In other words, one will be more of the outside, you know, does the outside work, and the other is more the relationship type. Uh, One is more um, uh, focused on being in charge, kind of the protection and providing, and the other one is more in the emotional support. And typically, even in same-sex relationships, they kind of break up that way. And in that case, I would say the one that's kind of in the more male role would be the leader. Now, they may be relationships that there is not a more male role. They're just two people, and neither one of them really fits any of the stereotypes. And that's okay, too. They can just work it together. You see, it's not like there's any one way that you have to do this. You're all individuals, and your relationships are all individual. They all have different ratios of of need and love in them. You just need to find a way that works for you. It's not a, here's the prescription, everybody needs to do this. It's, here's an idea, a set of 
you know, I'm talking in general terms so that people will get an idea of what I'm talking about and then go figure their own way of implementing that. Yeah, I don't want to be seen as making a prescription. Here's how you do it so much as here's the process. Here's what we're talking about. These are the, these are the variables. You know, go work it in a way that suits you because we have men and women and we have relationships that vary from one extreme to the other. You can't say that all men are like this and all women are like that. That is just not true. Men are cover the, the range from both poles, one pole to the other, and so do women. And that's not saying that, oh, if you're not under the fat part of the curve, there's something wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. You're just different. You're not like everybody else. Nothing wrong with that at all. We love diversity and different people. You're all, no matter how different you are, you can all love and you all have a capacity to love and a capacity to become love, no matter what your kind of relationship. So this, this works just the same no matter who we're talking to. And with, no matter how old you are, you can be 15 or you can, you can be 80. And it's all the same. It works just the same way. These programs run forever, like I say. And love is forever. There's no age where this applies and, and doesn't apply. There's no relationship where this doesn't apply. The relationship you have between yourself and your boss and your, and your mentors and your teachers and your neighbors, they'll all get better if you approach them from the point of, what can I do for you? What can I do that makes your situation better? If you approach all your relationships that way, your relationships will get better in every front. This is relationship in general. We're just kind of taking the male-female relationship as, a, as an example, how you do that. But all relationships will get better. Your whole life will get better when you start thinking more about what you can do for others and less about your needs, what you need others to do for you. Well, Tom, this is absolutely stunningly beautiful, um, what you've been saying, and I'm sure that it will challenge and thrill and delight and present challenges for a lot of people, That and I hope our listeners will appreciate the depth of wisdom you've just shared with us, so thank you very much. It's a whole other paradigm on being people are having marital problems and they go to a marriage counselor, what will that marriage counselor tell them? Probably how to renegotiate, how to be better negotiators. The counselor will say, well, you know, you need to stop throwing your dirty laundry around on the floor and da, 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 and you know, you really ought to give a little on this and you two need to, you know, grow up and act like adults and, and not uh, fight like children. And they will help you negotiate a more workable contract for now as opposed to the contract that you negotiated before that isn't working any longer, but not really fixing the relationship. That's treating the symptoms. It's a need-based relationship. That's the fundamental problem. The symptoms then are the arguments and the stress and the she's not doing what I need and he's not doing what I need and all that's just the symptoms of it. You can change people's behavior and not change them fundamentally at the being level and you don't really have much. All you've got is uh, is kind of better behavior for a short period of time, and then the behavior always eventually goes back to what's inside. You know, people have to be who and what they are. So even if we promise and see it's a better way to be and we try to behave differently, it's the wrong approach. Don't approach it as a behavioral modification. Approach it as a being modification. You have to become somebody else, and you don't fix it by working on the symptoms. You fix it by working on the problem. And the problem is ego, fear, it's about you, you're afraid that you won't get what you need and what you want. That basis, this ego fear basis does not make good relationships of any sort, whether it's male, female or relationships or any other kind of relationship. It's a whole new paradigm. It's a whole new way to approach other people is to approach them with love rather than with what you want from them. And if we can do this especially in our most intimate relationships, I can't help but feel that that will ripple out to everyone where we touch and all of our relationships. That is true, and it, it will be a very powerful example for other people just to see that that can exist. Relationship based on love, for most people, that gives them the 
probably the first time they've, they've ever had this sense that it could really be that way. It's a wonderful example, and that's true. Because the male-female connection, because of these programs that we run and kind of set us up to do this together, and it solves all of our problems, and it eliminates problems. If you're in a love of relationship, you don't want to go out and you know, have an affair with other that would be so off of your list of something to do. And the fact that you have some programming that says, well, that would be okay if, you know, if it comes up, you have no interest. You're so totally satisfied and connected with another person that that's not important. So this love-love relationship satisfies the, the programming and basically obviates the things that, that clash. Solution all the way around for, for everyone. And it helps you, like you say, it helps you learn and grow in all the rest of your life and existence as well. And it's a real good way to start because it's natural. We're already pushed by our programming to this, this sort of pair bonding. Well, thank you, Tom. So many wise words and uh, very much appreciated. This completes the second segment of the four-part series, Tom Campbell at Sky Blue Symposia. 